We've been studying the, the prophecy of Daniel. Last night we finished Daniel chapter 3, and we saw the parallels with the mark of the beast and the image to the beast that will arise in the earth very shortly. We see what it means in terms of the obedience to the covenant of the Most High. And brothers and sisters, that's, that's, that's what, it really, what it comes down to. Our obedience to the covenants of the Most High. Now, this is the thing. Um, there's all kind of, as you know, there are all kind of erroneous and deceivable teachings in the earth today. And, and, they're, and they're basically in this regard, with regard to the covenant of the Most High, is broken up into two camps. Basically, there are people that don't believe you can obey the covenant, and there's people that believe you can obey the covenant. Okay, uh, people that don't believe you can obey the covenant, generally these are focused on the what they call the New Testament, which what we call the renewed covenant. Now, we understand and believe that the entire Bible as given to us from Genesis to Revelation is one Bible. Even though there is a division in there that says Old Testament and New Testament, we know it to be the covenant of the Most High, which has been renewed with Israel and Judah. So there's not two gods, there's not two outlooks, there's just one Bible, and there's one truth, and there's one spirit, and there's one Most High Yah. There's not two gods, there's one Most High Yah. And he has a son, Mashiach, Yahawashiah, Mashiach, who they call Jesus Christ. But there's only one God above all, that is Yahweh, Almighty Yah, Al Shaddai. So we know that the covenant is eternal. It is forever. It never ceases. That's so on one side. The other side, the people that says there is a covenant, there's a division even among them. There are some of them that, that, that believe that you have to just keep it and there's no spirit involved. And then there's others that understand that only by the spirit you can obey. That would be the truth. Because man has fallen. That's what we have to understand. Man has fallen. He is in sin. What is sin? It is the breaking of the covenant of the Most High. The breaking of his commandments is sin. Okay? So because of the spirit of sin, the Most High sends us a new spirit. His spirit of obedience and righteousness. We need that spirit in order to perfectly obey the covenant. Because the Bible tells us that Yah is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. You can't just obey him in the flesh without his spirit working within you. You understand? The people that try to do that are the most unhappy of people because they're always trying to force obedience. You see, They don't allow the spirit of the most high. They don't seek the spirit of the most high to guide them in what they should do. So we do believe that we need the spirit of the most high, that it is coming and being baptized upon us by his son, the Mashiach, who the Bible says will baptize us with the Holy Ghost. He baptizes with the father's spirit. It is the spirit of his father. I'll talk more about that later. Because of the spirit of the father, we are abled or enabled to obey his commandments. Because of his spirit convicting us and guiding us and strengthening us in holiness and righteousness. The covenant is also holiness and righteousness. So we need a spirit of holiness and righteousness to obey it. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? You can't obey a law of holiness and righteousness if your spirit is of disobedience. Right? So we need a spirit of holiness and righteousness. And, and there is a spirit of holiness and righteousness. It comes from the Most High Father, comes through his son. And that spirit we receive by faith. And that spirit is what caused us to be obedient to his word. You see, there are people that ignore the fact that there are spiritual entities around us. That there are angels we can't see and that there are spirits that move both evil and good and they move on our hearts and they move on our minds and they uh, and, and they affect how we think and what we do. But there are. And we have to understand that as followers of the most high, we are seeking us his spirit to guide us and direct our path. We have already been under the other spirit before. In fact, let's look and see what Ephesians tells us about this. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, 
from verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2 from verses 1 to 3. This epistle of Paul to the church at Ephesus, the converted Hebrews and natural Hebrews at Ephesus. Notice what he says. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, children of wrath even as others notice the words here by nature children of wrath walking according to the spirit of disobedience do you see that testing one two three so you can see we in the past before we come to the truth of the most high we walk in a spirit of disobedience we walk in a spirit of wrath and of fear even it tells us that also the spirit of fear that all comes naturally as a result of disobedience to the most high being disconnected from the Most High Yah. But through the Mashiach, he gives us grace. That means he gives us power that we don't deserve, but that we need to be obedient. Through the blood of the Mashiach, penalty for sin has been paid for the children of Israel. Penalty for sin has been paid for the Hebrews. And be, through the spirit of the Mashiach, which is the Father's spirit, we are obedient to his commandments, statutes, and judgments. That's the gospel. That's justification by faith. Being cleared of all guilt, though you don't deserve it. That is the centerpiece of the plan of salvation of the Most High. And that centerpiece brings all people who receive it back into harmony with the broken covenant. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Because that's the whole duty of man. Isn't that what the scriptures say? Fear Yah and keep his commandments. For this is the what? The whole duty of man. For Yah shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You understand? So that is the centerpiece. And the object is to bring us into obedience to the covenant. Because that's what happened. You see, brothers and sisters, the enemy did not have any foothold on this earth until our parents, Adam and Eve, the parents of all the people of the earth, our parents disobeyed the, the, the law of the Most High. When they disobeyed his express command, that's when the devil got a foothold and the spirit of disobedience came on the earth. You understand? Through them, he came on the earth, right? If it wasn't for their disobedience, he'd have never got a foothold here. Nothing would have ever died. There'd been no death, no destruction, no, no wrath, no sin. There'd be none of that. Nothing but, but, but life. But they did. And so in order to counteract that, Most High sent his son in the image of a man. He sent him in the image of a man, born of the seed of the Holy Ghost, which means he is made of the Holy Ghost seed and the seed of Mary, the human seed. That's how people, babies are born, isn't it? The seed of the father comes into the seed of the mother and, and they create a baby. Isn't that how it works? Yeah. So the seed of the father in this case, the angel Gabriel or Gabriel told them that which is in her is conceived of the Holy Ghost. That is why the Messiah, Bible says about him, he baptized him with the Holy Ghost because it's part of who he is. His father's spirit is part of who he is. I'm going to talk more about that later. But I bring all that up to bring up the conversion of a Babylonian, which is what we're talking about today. The conversion of a Babylonian, Nebuchadnezzar. And we talk about Nebuchadnezzar as we study Daniel. I mean, let's, let's review what we know about him. He's a king of Babylon. He was, a, he was a king and he was able to conquer large portions of the then known civilized world, of the then known civilized world. So at that time, you still had uh, uh, kingdoms in other parts of the earth, but the most powerful kingdom that the Most High recognized was this one, Babylon. And his kingdom stretched from what is now Iran and Iraq to the north and Turkey. It stretched all the way to the east into India and what is now Pakistan. He stretched all the way into the west and the south, what is Saudi Arabia and Yemen into north, I'm sorry, northeast Africa. 
and, and, and Mizraim, which is called Egypt, and Ethiopia, which is Cush. The Babylonian kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar stretched all that territory, very large, large piece of territory that he covered, okay? Very powerful king was Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was founded by a, a, a child of Ham. Ham was one of the three sons of Noah, and one of his sons was Cush. Cush was the founder of what we know as Ethiopia in Africa. And although the Ethiopia that he founded was most of the continent of Africa. See, we have limited it to a small piece of Africa today, but it used to be most of Africa. Okay? That's Cush. Cush had a son named Nimrod. Nimrod, Nimrod was worshipped as a god. Apparently a very powerful hunter and a powerful military and, and, and political person. And he created the kingdom of Babylon and it started in the land of Shinar, which is now Iraq. He was a Hamite. But he came and he took over a land that was by a, a man named Ashur. Ashur was actually a Semite. And so Ashur's Semite land was taken over by this Hamite Nimrod. That's why you have the Assyrians. Have you ever seen that term? Assyrians is associated with Babylon. But they're really Hamite. I mean, I'm sorry. They're really Semite that was taken over by Nimrod. Okay. You have Assyrian. And so... Nebuchadnezzar comes out of this background, okay? He's a Babylonian. He, they, they were heathen. They worshipped uh, the sun, the moon, the stars. They were spiritualists. They were into astrology. And, and he was the king of this kingdom, very powerful kingdom. In fact, the Most High called it the kingdom representing gold. He called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He called Nebuchadnezzar his servant, even though Nebuchadnezzar didn't know him. He has done that before. He has brought forth people that didn't know who he was or didn't know that he existed, but that he knew who they were, and he brought them forth from the womb for his purposes. See, the Most High has the power to do it. So he brought forth Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar was used to punish many nations, particularly the nation of Israel. He was used to punish them because they had did the, the bad sin or the, the heinous sin of worshiping other gods, other, mo, other aliyim aside from the Most High Yah. The first thing he told them when he gave them his covenant, I am Yahweh thy aliyim which I brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other aliyim before me. Don't make any graven images, no likeness of anything. That's the worst thing you could do. It's the first thing he said. Don't worship any other God. I'm the one. I'm the one that redeemed you. I'm the one that talked to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't, don't, don't cheat on me with another false God, with a false God. Well, they did that. They did it for a long time. They did it over and over and over and over again until finally Most High sent Nebuchadnezzar there to destroy the whole thing, just level Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and he took captives. And he not only got Jerusalem, he went to Mizraim, Egypt, took that. He went to the, to the, to the coastline, Palestinian, went over there, took that. Everywhere he went, he took. Okay? He was the most powerful king. Being a king and being a man, he started, of course, to believe, as most sinners do, that he was a god. Okay? He thought he was a god. He had people worshiping him, bowing to him. But he happened to have, he happened to have uh, captured, captured some faithful Hebrew Israelites, Daniel among them. And this would be a turning point for him. As a matter of fact, as you look at the book of Ezekiel, there's a passage in Ezekiel where Nebuchadnezzar, you see, Nebuchadnezzar had respect. He had respect for spiritual things. That is why even though he destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, and, and, the, and the scriptures indicate it, it was something he did not really want to do, but that it was ordained from the Most High that he do it. Okay? I want to show you. There's something really he didn't want to do. 
because he had respect to spiritual things. He was really a man that sought after truth and sought after spiritual things. That's why he didn't, even though he destroyed the temple, the holy vessels, he didn't destroy those. He took them and he took care of them. He was taking care of the holy vessels that were in the temple. Let me show you a little background concerning this in Ezekiel chapter 21. In Ezekiel chapter 21. Ezekiel 21. And I'm going to show you, it shows you in this book what was going through his mind as he was about to march on, on Jerusalem and on Israel. Notice what it says, Ezekiel chapter 21. I'm going to begin at verse 18. And read down to verse 23. Notice what it says. The word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Also, son of man, appoint thee two ways, that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. Both twain shall come forth out of one land, and choose thou a place, choose it at the head of the way to the city. Appoint a way that the sword may come to Rabbath of the Ammonites and to Judah of Jerusalem, the defense. Notice verse 21. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way. That means he stood between the Ammonites and, he, and, and Judah at the head of the two ways to use divination. So he was, trying to, he was trying to consult with spirits to find out which way he should go, right? He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. At his right hand was the was the divination for Jerusalem to appoint captains to open the mouth of in the slaughter, to lift up the voice of, with shouting, to appoint battering rams against the gate, to cast a mountain to build a fort. And it shall and it shall be unto him as a false divination in their sight, to them that have sworn oaths, but he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. What does that mean? So in other words, they started worshiping all the different gods aside from the original one that brought them in. He was thinking about what should I take this city? And he was trying to consult with what he knew best. He didn't know the most high y'all. He was consulting with divination and spirits and things, trying to decide, should I take this one? But then he remembered how wild they have become. See, they became wild. They became party and wild and, and, and falsehood. He reminded how they left what David had taught. So he said, okay, I should take that too. And he went. Right? So he took the city. And he took captives. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah among them. He has seen miracles through Daniel. He has seen miracles, as we saw in chapter 3, through Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He observed the miracles. And he was overwhelmed by the things he saw from these brothers. And all they would talk about, all they were they were give honor to was the most high Yah, right? Daniel said, There's a God in heaven that revealed his secret. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah said, Our God whom we serve will save us from your hand. We are careful to answer you. We have to think about it. And he can deliver us out of your hand. And if he don't, we still gonna die. But we're not serving your gods. Praise the most high. So he saw that. He saw the faithfulness of these, and he saw the Most High deliver them. He saw them get delivered from certain death. So now, chapter 4 is how he became converted. He becomes converted. A Babylonian king, the Babylonian king, becomes converted. This is not Nimrod. This is not Belshazzar, his grandson, who ends up messing up badly. This is this man, Nebuchadnezzar. And what does it mean for us in 2016 and going forward? Well, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that there will be Gentiles converted to the Most High Yah. And they're going to be converted the way Nebuchadnezzar was. And we're going to see what happened. First, they're going to observe the faithfulness of the remnant. Right? They're going to see that because we saw he saw the faithfulness of Daniel. He saw the faithfulness of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the only ones that were faithful among all of those Hebrews that were brought there. He saw their faithfulness. He saw their devotion to the Most High, their obedience to his covenant, regardless of being captives in a foreign land. So he saw their example. Then the Most High began to work on him, to humble him. See, brothers and sisters, it always comes back to that, doesn't it? Even with the Most High's true people, he said, if my people, 
who are called by my name shall do what? Shall humble themselves and pray. Right? It always comes back to that. And turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It always comes back to a person having to humble himself before the Most High. Well, why is that? Because with the spirit of disobedience, as you all are very well aware in your own person, tell me if I'm telling the truth or not when I get ready to say this. With the spirit of disobedience, right, comes the spirit of pride. Isn't that true? Doesn't it? Spirit of disobedience brings the spirit of pride also. So you have to be humble when you come toward the king of the universe, Yah. The king of all the universe is Yah, the most high. And you have to be humble before you come before him. You have to give him his respect. So it starts off with a humiliation process. We have to be humble enough to give him that honor and respect. And then we have to also learn to trust him. These things were Nebuchadnezzar was learning. Okay, these things he was learning. So now let's look at this. Chapter four begins, really it begins at the end. And what I mean by that is, when you read chapter four of Daniel, you have to understand Nebuchadnezzar is giving you his testimony. That's what he's doing. He's giving you his testimony. And that's the thing, brothers and sisters. Every person that surrenders themselves to the Most High Yahweh in the name of the Mashiach Yahweh, Yahweh Shah, the people that do that, that truly do that, and receive what we were talking about earlier, the spirit of obedience and righteousness, that spirit that takes over your soul when you ask him for it, that spirit that, get, that he gives to you when you've been cleansed by the sacred blood of the Mashiach from all your sin. That spirit that comes over you and calls you to be what the Bible calls born again. You're going to have a testimony. You understand? You're going to have a testimony. You're going to have a testimony. And you're going to be able to say what happened to you. Because people are going to ask, what happened to you? What happened to me? I surrendered. And the story is the same. I surrendered my life. To the Most High, yeah. I surrendered in the name of the Messiah. You might say Jesus, whatever. But it's Yahweh Shah. You might not know that at the time. I did. I surrendered my life to Jesus, and He pointed me to the Father, and He changed my whole outlook. He changed my life, right? Isn't that what happens? He changes your outlook. He changes the way you see things. He changes how you think. He changes you. He works on you from within and changes you. Yes, he does. And so all of us have a testimony. There'll be nobody standing on a sea of glass that doesn't have a testimony. And the people that are his, that remain his, that stay firm and grow like a plant that takes root downward and grows upward, they will have learned through trial and tribulation to trust the Most High. They will learn through fiery trials and tribulations, things that push them to the edge, to trust the Most High. So all of us that stand on the sea of glass, all of us that are redeemed and going to the new Jerusalem will have a testimony. Nebuchadnezzar is no different. So he starts off chapter four. He's giving a testimony. You have to understand that. So he's telling you in the beginning of chapter four, he's converted already. And so he's telling you how it all began from a converted standpoint. So, so he's, he's recalling how it happened. You understand? So he's already converted. And when he's starting to write this stuff that we see in chapter four, he's telling you how he got converted. Okay? He's explaining it to you. So let's look at it. Daniel chapter four from verses one to three. He starts off giving praise to the most high. Notice what it says. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high, most high, has brought toward me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. So you see how he starts off? He's giving honor and praise to the most high, right? And aside from giving honor and praise to the most high, he's testifying that the kingdom, even though Nebuchadnezzar himself is a king, he said Nebuchadnezzar the king, he understands now that there is a kingdom bigger than his by somebody higher than him. His kingdom, he says, is an everlasting kingdom. 
and his dominion from generation to generation. You understand? So he's already saying, he, you know, whereas in Daniel 3, he was rebelling against the idea that his kingdom would come to an end. He's rebelling against the, uh, the very idea that the Messiah would set up his own kingdom that shall last forever. He's rebelling against that. But here in chapter 4, you can see he surrendered to it. And so he said, his kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting, from generation to generation. He is most high. See? And he said he thought it good to show the signs and wonders that Aliyim wrote what wrought toward him, how he was converted. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Daniel chapter 4, from verse 4 down to verse 8. Daniel chapter 4, actually from 4 to 7. Sorry, Daniel chapter 4 from 4 to 7. Notice what it says. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. All right, so now he has a dream. You know, we've been here with, with Nebuchadnezzar before, right? <laughs> Daniel chapter 2, he had a dream then. And so uh, <laughs> the people of the kingdom knew how he was when it came to these dreams, right? So he had a dream, and now he remembers what the dream is. He needs them to interpret it. They don't want to mess around with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Daniel too. They don't want to mess around with him. So they wasn't giving him no false interpretations. It would cost them their head. They just plainly said they couldn't make known. That they didn't know about this dream. They didn't understand it. Or maybe they did and didn't want to tell him. But either way, he didn't get an answer. Okay? So he made a decree for somebody to tell him. He had this dream. It bothered him, just like in Daniel 2. But this one was more personal. Let's look at D Daniel chapter 4. Verse 8. Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. Let's look at verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him, I told the dream saying. So let's stop right here. I want you to notice he calls him Daniel. This is the first time you see in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar calls him Daniel. Daniel. And notice he said his name was Belteshazzar because he had named him according to the Babylonian gods. But here he's acknowledging his true Hebrew name, Daniel. He's acknowledging his true Hebrew name. And he says his name was Belteshazzar according to this, you know, according to my God, the God that I served before, in whom is the spirit of the holy most high. See? So he's acknowledging Daniel as a man of the most high, he's acknowledging Daniel as a Hebrew. And, and for the sake of telling us the story, he's saying to us, his name used to be Belshazzar. I had called him Belshazzar. So he gave him back his original name. You understand? That's that's a very important for us to understand where his mind is. So he gave him back his original name. Huh? All right, everybody got that? Then they up. Then I ya up. Then I ya up. Okay, that was that's Daniel's name. I'm probably saying it incorrectly myself. I have to look it up. Dan, 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 Dan ah, or Danny ah. I know it's at all at the end. Dan ah, okay. Dan ah, but he's giving him. He's, he's saying his Hebrew name. So now he's he's recalling what happened at that time. He was not yet converted. So now he's saying his name was Belteshazzar. So at that time he was still calling him Belteshazzar. Now notice what this is. Daniel chapter nine. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 4, excuse me, Daniel chapter 4 from verse 9, and we're going to read the dream. So we're looking at Daniel chapter 4 from verse 9 down to verse, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Well, it's a long dream, so let's go from Daniel, from verse 9 down to verse 14, and we'll stop right there, okay? This, this, and then we'll continue. Daniel chapter 4 from verse 9 to verse 14. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret trouble is thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, 
and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of my, my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, the height thereof, and the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowls thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. So let's stop right here. So now he's, he's, he's relating to Daniel what he dreamt. Okay. Related to him, and he said, this is what he saw. He saw a tree, right? He saw a tree. He said it was a big tree. He said it, it reached to the end of the earth. Big tree. Giant tree. Imagine that. Giant tree planted in the earth, and it reaches its leaves, and its branches reach out to all the ends of the earth. That's a huge, 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 huge tree, right? Then he says about that tree, he says the leaves are fair. It's pretty. and have fruit, lots of fruit. And he said, people, he said animals were under, sit under the shadow of the tree. Okay? And he said, everybody was fed of this tree. Powerful tree. Huh? Powerful tree. But then, the Holy One, somebody came down from heaven, sound like an angel, and, and he gave a command to cut the tree down and scatter the fruit. And he get, they let the animals get away from under it and the, and the birds off his branches. Right? So, so he's seeing this big tree, this giant tree, get cut down. Okay? Let's continue. Daniel chapter 4 from verse 15 down to verse 18. The dream continues. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's heart, and let a beast's heart be given unto him. Seven and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Now, let's stop here. Now, so his heart was going to be changed. They're going to leave a stump of the tree. Notice they were, they were, they were going to bind the tree with iron and brass. Notice that. Going to bind the tree with iron and brass. And it was going to be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven times, the word times here is years. If you look up the word times in Hebrew, it is year. So seven years would go over this, okay? Seven years would go over this, this uh, would pass by. This would be the case of this tree for seven years, okay? And it says that the reason this was done, apparently, is to let the work, the earth know that it is the most high that ruleth the kingdom of men. It's not, in other words, it's the most high that's in charge, not man. The most high is in charge. So whatever it is, let them know the most high is in charge, not man. Okay. So now he said, okay, Daniel, this, this is what I dreamt now. Uh, tell me what it means. So now Daniel chapter four, I'm going to read from verse 19. Let's start at verse 19 and let's stop right there. Let's look at verse 19. Daniel chapter four, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, in the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. So Daniel was shocked at this dream that the Most High gave to Nebuchadnezzar. He was shocked. 
And he knew it was not good news for Nebuchadnezzar. He knew it was not good news. And he was he he didn't want to say, but he but he had to tell him because he is the prophet of the most high. This is the difference, brothers and sisters. A prophet of the most high must speak when the most high bids him, even if it costs him his or her their life. Okay. Yaconan, the Baptist, is an example of this. Yaconan was, was baptized in the womb by the Holy Ghost. Came out the womb a prophet of the Most High to, 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 to be the introducer of the Messiah to, to Israel. Okay, And when he was called forth to preach, he had to speak exactly what the Most High gave him. Even he stood in the king's face and said, you married a woman that's not your wife. And it cost him his head. He had to say it, though, because it was the spirit of the Most High. Okay, Jeremiah, they, they more than one occasion, they said they were going to kill him for the things that he said. But he had to speak because the spirit of the Most High, he said, it's like a fire in my bones and I can't stop. Got to say what he puts on my heart to say. So the prophet has to say. So here's Daniel the prophet and here's Nebuchadnezzar the king. He has to. He has to. Say what the Most High is given because it's not just Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is a warning from the Most High. Daniel recognizes it. This is a warning from the Most High. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When you start seeking the truth, the Most High will warn you of things. He will give you dreams and warn you. That's a sign of the last day. He said, men shall dream dreams and have visions. Isn't that what he said? And I know myself, I have many dreams. I know some of you had dreams. He will give you dreams. There will be warning dreams sometimes, like he gave Nebuchadnezzar, warning you of a way you're going that's not the way he wants you to go. Or he'll give you a dream about something that's getting ready to come into your life to warn you, to prepare you. See, because he's faithful. He tried to prepare you. He doesn't let us be surprised all the time. He's prepare us sometimes. He gives us an opportunity to be prepared. Okay? So here he's giving Nebuchadnezzar a warning dream. Giving him a warning dream. Okay? Okay. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. And let's look at verse 20. Daniel's going to give him the interpretation now. From verse 20, from verse 20 down to verse 23. Okay, then you're going to start to show him what this means. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, upon whose branch the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Whereas the king saw a watcher and the holy one come down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with beasts till seven times pass over him or seven years. Now, Daniel's interpreting the dream, right? So he's telling him, you're the tree. You're the tree, Nebuchadnezzar. That's representing you. That's representing your kingdom, right? That's representing your kingdom. So, so now Nebuchadnezzar already knows the dream showed the tree getting what? The tree getting chopped down, right? You already see the tree getting chopped down. So that's not good news, right? So here we go. Daniel's going to interpret the rest of this dream for him. Daniel chapter 4. From verse 24 down to verse 28. Daniel chapter 4, from verse 24 down to verse 28. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and give it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins 
by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be the lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Remember we talked about earlier how because of the spirit of disobedience that's in us naturally, we also have the spirit of pride. Spirit of pride. Spirit of pride is very strong, brothers and sisters. It is the spirit that caused Satan to fall out of heaven. Spirit of pride. The spirit of pride is so strong that a person can look at something and see that they're wrong and refuse to acknowledge that they're wrong. That's why repentance is a miracle from the most high. Because repentance brings you, is come through humility, right? So a person is acknowledging they are wrong. Generally speaking, somebody like a Judas will acknowledge they're wrong when their plan gets all messed up, right? That's not the type of thing we're talking about. We're talking about a person that acknowledges wrong and wants to change. Not just sorry that they, that they diabolical plan didn't work, but wants to actually change. Or should I say, wants to be changed. That's what we're talking about. So the spirit of pride, a person will look at something and see that it's wrong, but because of their pride, they won't acknowledge that it's wrong or that they are wrong. Nebuchadnezzar had this problem. And one of the ways the most high deals with it when he's trying to save a person is to bring them to an embarrassing and humble situation. Okay? To bring them to an embarrassing and humble situation. I can really relate to this personally. I will tell you how. I was never a king, obviously. Really? Never a king. <laughs> but one day I had a dream. And the dream troubled me from the dream. And I heard a voice. And the voice said, all this came upon the man Glasgow. And I wondered what that meant. And I, I found out after that. I went through seven years. Of hell. And as I look back, I praise the most high for the seven years of hell. I tell you why. Because if he didn't humble me like that, I'd be a lost man. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he humbled me like that. End up losing my home, losing my business, almost lost the whole family. Was on my own in a room in Washington, D.C., making a third of the money I used to make. Beneath people that in the past I would. You know, I would even be loath to hire them for my business. But he had to humble me in order for me to get closer to him, in order for me to be able to be used by him in the way he wants. See, Nebuchadnezzar had to experience this, as will any person who he's trying to save. Any person that he's trying to save. Got to be humble enough to admit where you're wrong. Humble enough. Or be brought to humility where you can admit you need to change your ways. And you acknowledge you need a new spirit working in you. He can give you a new spirit to work within you. As he did for myself. As he did for many others. And as he did for many for, for Nebuchadnezzar. He can give you a new spirit to work within you. Okay. And even then. <laughs> even then. Yourself. Because otherwise that pride spirit will come back. It will come back. And it will cause you to have to go through this all over again. And you don't want that, brothers and sisters, believe me. So every day you hit your knees and you humble yourself before the most high. When you do wrong, he will, he will bring you in a situation where you do wrong. You say, what? Yeah. So that you can say, you can, you can utter these words, these words. I was very difficult for human beings to say those words. I was wrong. I am sorry I was wrong. Huh? Very difficult words for human beings to say. I'm sorry I was wrong. Very difficult. Huh? Especially when that pride spirit is on you. Very difficult. And yet those are the very words we need to become one with the most high. Those are the words we need. For him to put his spirit on us and for us to walk in obedience to his covenant. Okay? And it's not for us. Listen to me carefully here, brothers and sisters. It's not for us to point that out to anybody else. Because then we're missing ourselves, right? <laughs> it's not for me to point it out to somebody and say, you need to humble yourself. 
unless the Spirit of the Most High calls me and told me to prophesy. That's different. But it's for me to make sure I am humble. For me to make sure I am sorry for what I have done. For me to make sure I humble myself before the Most High so that he can work in my heart. See? It's important for us to recognize. And Nebuchadnezzar, it was not easy. As you get ready to see, it was not easy for him to get to this point. He was a tough nut to crack. And that's the difference in, in large part between those people that will be saved and those that aren't. Going to church don't save you. Carrying a Bible don't save you. Humbling yourself before the Most High, that can save you. Huh? That can save you. Okay? Knowing the truth, that can save you if you're humble. That can save you. But if you, if you have pride, Pride is a poison. It is the kryptonite to salvation. It is kryptonite to salvation. It will ruin it. You understand? So let's look. Daniel chapter 4. And let's see what happened. After he had now he got this dream. He showed that he needed to humble himself. Daniel gave him the interpretation. Let's see what happened. Daniel chapter 4. From verse 29. And verse 30. Watch this. Daniel 4, verse 29 and verse 30. Notice what the scripture said. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So he, he this was bothering him for a whole year. He received this information in the dream he received the interpretation from daniel and a whole year went by he didn't act right away a whole year went by and one day he got up and said man humble what humble what is not he's looking around he's in a palace right it's hard for a rich person to get it's hard to messiah did say hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven didn't he say that it's hard. You know why? Because he stands up. He's in a palace, man. He's got servants everywhere. He can have anything he wants. At any moment he wants it, he can have it. He's the king of the most powerful kingdom on the planet. So he stands up and he looks around. He sees all this and he said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power, for the honor of my majesty? His pride rose up against what he was shown. His pride rose up. And notice what happened. Daniel chapter 4, verse 31, down to verse 33. Daniel chapter 4, verse 31, down to verse 33. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. So he turned into some sort of animal, apparently, right? They try to give, I've read, and they try to give this a name. Men always try to name some diseases if they can corner it and name it. It's kind of stupid, really. But but I would tell you, the Most High brought this on him, obviously. The Most High brought this on him. And as he brings it on him, he can take it off him, right? But he, he caused him to lose his mind temporarily. He became like an animal. He was humbled. Okay? He wasn't sitting on the throne anymore. He was in a field eating grass till he understood. Seven years had to go by till he understood that without the Most High, you're nothing. The Most High sets up kingdoms. He gonna have a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, not man. There's no kingdom made by any man, no nation created and started by any men that's gonna last forever. None. Only a kingdom from the Most High is going to last forever. That's why he said, 
about Messiah, he shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And here in Daniel, we're going to read that several times. We saw it in Daniel chapter 2. We're going to see it in Daniel chapter 7. We're going to see it in uh, Daniel chapter 9. We're going to see it in different places. But the Most High is going to set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Not, not be left to other people. It's going to be his kingdom. Made up with his people. So now he's humble. In seven years, he's an animal. Now, look, brothers and sisters, as I said earlier, this is a sign of the last days also. And why? Because you're going to have Gentiles, heathen, hear the 144,000's message of warning. And they're going to humble themselves and take their stand with the most high. And they're going to lose everything. They're going to lose house, car, friends, family. Don't, don't get it twisted. To stand for the most high in the last days, you're not going to have no friends. It's not going to be about you in some church with a bunch of congregants. It's going to be just you having to take your stand. And if you do that, your church is going to be against you. Believe it. You say, how do you know that? Read the Bible. Read what happened to John the Baptist. Read what happened to Jesus. Read what happened to the prophets when they stood. They stood alone. Paul was before Nero. The Bible said he was he was testifying he, and everybody forsook him and he stood by himself. Nobody stood with him. You're going to have to stand alone. That's why it's a remnant. You're not going to have a crowd with you. You're not going to have people supporting you. You're not going to happen. That's why we have to learn to trust the most high and his word for ourselves, by ourselves. We need to learn to trust it. With our own experience, what he's done for you and me, we need to understand that so that we can stand. Yeah, we'll have a few brothers and sisters with us. Most people that you know, most of your friends, your family, they're going to turn on you. No question. They're going to do it. It's, it's the Bible shows you. It's happened to many prophets. It happened to Moses. It happened to Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Many prophets. This happened to Amos, many prophets. It's part and parcel, part of the road, man. Part of the part of the part of the road, part of the the, the the journey, part of the journey. That's the word I'm looking for. Part of the journey, especially in these last days of Earth's history in which we live, it's going to happen, man. That's why you see uh, today we're the part of the culture popular culture of, of 2016 is people bandwagon like they get in groups and they you know they they, they favorite sports team they, they get in large groups and they think because it's all of them you know that they they the best or they get in large political organizations republican democrat they get and they think oh, okay we all the same we all together or they get in large mega churches and think because their church is so big and their building so big that they safe and all of that's going to be swept away and destroyed just quick most high swept all that away and destroyed. You're going to end up having to stand for yourself for the truth. You're going to have to stand for yourself. You've got to humble yourself. Say, I'm sorry I was wrong. Most high. I'm sorry I was wrong. People, you did wrong. For the truth. People are going to think you're crazy. There's no question. People are, in this world is full of deceit. Truth is, truth is, truth is, 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 is against it. You think the world loves truth? You gotta think again. They don't want truth. They want popularity. They want money. They want influence and power. They don't want truth. They don't want that. So you're gonna have to stand for the truth. You're gonna have to be humbled. It's gonna come. See, I'm not painting no picture of a rosy picture, you know, skipping into heaven. No, oh, I raised my hand. I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You're going to be proven, tried. We're going to see, because when you really take your stand for the Most High and you really accept the Messiah and receive the spirit of righteousness and cleansing of his blood from all your sin, when you really do that, the devil notices you. He takes notice of you. See, before that, you're just part of a crew. You're just like a, a bunch of cows in a in a field. You don't, you know, you're just one of his cows. But when you decide to take a stand for the most high y'all and for the word, he knows you get his notice and attention. And he say, Oh, we're gonna see. You gonna stand there? Okay, we're gonna see how much you stand. And the most high allows him to try you like he allowed him to try Job. And we're gonna see. 
It ain't about how much money you have, how many friends you got. It ain't about all of that. It's going to be about, are you going to stand for truth or aren't you? That's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down to. And here's, here's Nebuchadnezzar, humble man, turned into almost like an animal. Didn't even know who he was for seven years. Most High said he might need that in order to be converted. So let's look at it. Daniel chapter 4. Let's finish the chapter. Daniel chapter 4 from verse 34 down to verse 37. Daniel chapter 4 from 34 down to 37. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can say, stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. For the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride. See, that's what it was about. He is able to abase. That's what it's about, that pride. It's the same with Job. Job had a pride problem. If you read the if you read the book of Job, if you really read it, it was it was it was about his pride, man. He stood for the truth, right? But he still had that pride in him, and that, that trial that he went through had to bring break down that pride, man. And that's why at the at first he was he started talking after a while, saying, "I have done righteousness, and the Most High has done this to me. I don't know why He did this to me. I am righteous, and the Most High has hurt me, and I don't know why He did this to me." He kept saying that in the book. When you read it. Until, and his friends kept saying, nah, you sinned. You know you sinned. Just talk your sin. Just tell us what you did. And he said, I ain't do nothing. He just did this to me. And I'm righteous. Finally, a young man came. Broke it down for him. He said, he said, you have affliction and pride. And you, told, and you chose pride. You chose iniquity rather than affliction. And he broke it down. Then the Most High talked to him. And he showed him this fish called the Leviathan. And he talked about the Leviathan. And he said, Leviathan is, is representative of Satan. He said, Leviathan is king of all the children of pride. You know what Job said then? He said, I humble myself and repent in dust and ashes. Because the trial was to bring out, to bring out that pus of pride and get rid of it. All of us going to go through it, brothers and sisters. If we're going to make it to the kingdom and stand on streets of gold, he is going to bring us through it. There is no question about it. He's going to bring us through it. I know he's not finished with me, and I know he's not finished with anybody on this planet until the day comes when he seals us in his Holy Spirit, seals us for good. That's at the end. Or he puts us to rest in the grave until the resurrection, one or the other. But he's going to get rid of that pride. Otherwise, we can't make it because he's not going to have this thing over again. There's not going to be another rebellion after this. Not going to be another one. Not going to be another Satan after this one is destroyed. Not going to happen. Therefore, there'll be no more pride problem. It's going to have to go away. So there'll be no one in the kingdom with that problem. Okay? Nobody in the kingdom with that problem. Let's have a word of prayer. Then we'll take a break and we'll come back. Get it.